Is it true that um, the horses in Florida have specifically evolved different than other horses to where they can actually stand in water for days without their, their hooves being destroyed? That's, that's my understanding. Mm-hmm. And they, they call them cracker horses, but they're, they're horses that came from the Spanish, the marsh tackies or the, you know, the Andalusian horses and cattle. Mm-hmm. But they live wild in the Florida woods for several centuries. And same with the cattle. And so right. the, I've heard it said that they've adapted where they're, they're less bothered by the insects and they can stand skin. They can stand in the water all day. Mm-hmm. They're they're smaller. They're nimble. I mean, same with the cattle. The the cracker cattle. They're not going to gain the weight the way that a Hereford or an Angus or these English breeds will when you put them on feed. But they're going to survive on palmettos or in the deep woods. Right. And the, when the early when like when my ancestors came to Florida, there was so many different waves of kind of migration into Florida. Most of the original natives here, the Calusa, the Tamuquin, the Tocobaga, the, all these amazing civilizations of native people were basically wiped out by Spanish disease. Mm-hmm. Um, to the point, I mean, I think the last Calusa passed away in, in Cuba, like were brought there on display or something wow. awful. But so, the the Miccosukee Indians, the Seminole Indians who are here today, Florida was part of their territory, but they were Creek people from, you know, north of Alabama and through the southeast who ranged and traded and had a presence in Florida. Oh, okay. But they really got pushed here during the Trail of Tears, during like the Seminole Wars, during the trying to extirpate native people from in this really dark history of trying to move native people off the land and push them out to reservations in Oklahoma and so forth. Right. The the Seminoles pushed into the Everglades. When, when are we talking roughly? 1700s, 1700s. 1800s. I mean, and Ponce de Leon came in the 1500s, right? Ponce de Leon came. Yeah. 1521 was his second voyage. Okay. And that's when the cattle and horses came for the first time and the hogs, right? I think hogs. Uh-huh. And he also, he got a souvenir as, of, as an arrow from a Calusa Indian. A and, poison arrow, right? And went and died of his wounds in, in Cuba. <sighs> but horses and cattle stayed. And I mean, I don't know if those exact cattle produced lineages that stayed for long. They may have eaten most of them, who knows. But subsequent Spanish missions kept coming and they kept bringing horses and cattle. And um, disease. And disease. But the cattle naturalized to the Florida woods. And so by the time my ancestors came in the mid 15, in the mid 1800s, in most of the kind of pioneer American American colonists at that time, cattle had been living in the Florida woods for three centuries. Wow. And so it was a naturally occurring resource where if you're a, you know, a poor cracker settler moving down into Florida, trying to scratch out an existence, you can get some good dogs and a brand and a horse and go round up cattle that live in the woods, make them your own and start to build some stability for your yeah, family. Right. If you, if you read the book, A Land Remembered. Mm, I haven't heard of it. Um, and a friend of mine is about to adapt it for a TV series, but it's, um, it's by Patrick Smith and it chronicles the life of a early pioneer Florida family all the way up through the generations up into Miami. And it kind of gets into these stories. Oh, interesting. It's really fascinating. Um, Do we know what Florida was like before the Spanish came? Like what was here? What kind of animals were here? Well, if we go back, and they're they're great fossil records for Florida. If you go Mm -hmm. back, what I think is really fascinating, if you go back 10,000 years to the end of the last ice age, yeah. Florida was twice as wide as it is now. Right. Because the oceans were 80 or, 80 or 100 feet lower. Right. And, and the shelf went out really wide, right? Right. On the <clears> East <throat> Coast, it, it looked practically the same because the shelf is steep. Yeah. But here in the Gulf, where you go fish at the middle grounds, 80 or 100 miles offshore, yep. that was land. The middle grounds was or, land? Or all the way, almost to the edge, like 80 miles, 100 miles from the coastline was the edge of the land where it drops off. Wow. And Steve, you got to find a, uh, an image of that or a, uh, an illustration of that. There's got to be one online. And so if you think about it 
at that time, Florida was drier than it is now. We still had woolly mammoths and bison and mastodons, like giant ground sloths. You know, yeah. I mean, all, right. all these big, massive animals that lived here, saber-toothed cats. Yep. But, but there were also people. And so like the early Native Americans were here 12, 13, 14, 15,000 years ago. And there's been this phenomenal, um, <laughs> Look at that, dude. Yeah, and, and <laughs> that's so, incredible. So there there would have been people living along that coastline. <clears throat> right. And all of those archaeological sites are deep underwater at this point and mm. mostly lost to the tide. Right. So we we don't even get a glimpse, but there's places if you've been to the rivers kind of south of Tallahassee, like the Scylla River or I, the St. Mark's River. I haven't spent much time up there now. Well, it's a really low energy coastline. Like basically mm -hmm. the beaches stop in Tarpon Springs, and then it turns to kind of a marshy coast up in that corner. Mm -hmm. Well, there are, these, there are these incredible underwater archeology span sites in that Big Bend area where there's these rivers like the Asilla River, which is a series of sinkholes. And when the water was lower, it would have been sinkholes, like kind of like the cenotes you see from the Yucatan, where the river would disappear underground and there were watering holes that the animals would go to. Yeah. <clears throat> well, they found the 11,000 year old mastodon skeleton with butcher marks on the tusks. What? And it's on display at the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville. And there was also- When did they find this? Um, in the past 40, 40 years or so. Wow. The guy, David Webb, who <clears throat> ran the underwater archeology span department at FSU found it, but then they found it was a prehistoric bison from 12,000 years ago that had a Clovis spear point in its skull that they found in this place. Oh my God, dude. So you've got this completely connected wild uh, continent where apparently the mastodons and the mammoths would migrate from the Appalachians mm -hmm. all the way down to the coast of Florida in the winter and back because they could trace from their fossilized dung or from some some index they could see the pollen and what was left behind. Like they have this picture of how all these things were fitting together back then. Wow, man, that's so bizarre. 